Welcome to today's episode of Break Into Law. My name is Cynthia Rivera, and for those of you who do not know me, I am the Director of Development, Partnership, and an advisor here at Barry Breakers, and I am delighted to have with us Dean Bernadette Horn, who is the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at St. John's School of Law. Thank you so much, and welcome. Thank you, Cynthia, for having me. So we want to start our conversation by getting to know you a little bit. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your current role? Sure. As, as you mentioned, I'm the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I came to this position from a position where I was responsible for career services and diversity initiatives. And I've been here for uh, three years. And my job touches every part of the law school. I work with the folks in alumni, with the folks in student services, with the faculty, with the student organizations, with the students, uh, admissions. I would say that I touch each office in the law school. You have a very diverse background. Yes. You have been involved with litigation. You've been involved in the corporate, corporate world. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, talk a little bit about those transitions for those um, members of the audience who are thinking about switching careers or perhaps uh, not sure, they're not sure as to what type of law they want to practice, or they think that they have to practice one type of law forever. Uh, can you talk a little bit about you know how you did it? Sure. I, I started out in products liability litigation. I worked for a law firm that was the national counsel for a British company that made asbestos um, related products. And so as their national counsel, we were responsible for um, trials and, and hearings all across the country. And so I would travel around the country defending that company um, against lawsuits. And although it sounds interesting and exciting, it actually got to be very monotonous because it was typically the same set of facts, just in a different state. And so I like to tell my students that I've probably been to 30 of the 50 states, but I didn't see anything except the airport and the road between the airport and the courthouse. And so I did that for about seven years before deciding um, that I wanted to do something different and something that still used a law degree. A law degree is so valuable because it makes you so um, flexible. You can do so many things with the legal training. And so I went to work for a corporate communications company and I was in their, um, in their simplified communications group. And so that was me and another attorney. And for our clients, we would take the legal mumbo jumbo that you find in documents and we would rewrite it in plain English. And so, um, one of my favorite projects was I did the terms and conditions for Sally Mae. And so when you take out a student loan and if you bother to read the terms and conditions and you understand them, I did that. <laughs> we, we know who to look for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the company was also responsible for creating the um, Internal Revenue Services, the 1040 EZ form. I didn't work on that project, but they did. Um, and so it was simply taking, as I said, the legal mumbo jumbo and making it plain English so that everyone who is reading it would understand. And so I did that for just about three years. And then um, one of the partners from my old law firm gave me a call and asked if I would come back to the firm. And I did. And after about a month, I said, oh, my goodness, I was right. I don't want to practice law. And at that time, a friend of mine uh, reached out about a job at a law school in their career services office. And I thought, I'm the perfect person for that. I've worked as an attorney in a firm. I've worked as an attorney in a corporation. I know exactly what to do and what to tell people to do. And so I did, I, I did leave uh, practice and went to work in career services. That is so wonderful. And thank you for, for sharing. And while you were speaking, uh, I was thinking about something that you mentioned related to uh, being able to transfer uh, right, some of those skills and how having a law degree allows you to do that. Can you talk a little bit more uh, about how, how students can position themselves or applicants 
when they're trying to present their transferable skills or sell their transferable skills, whether they're looking for a summer uh, position or whether they're applying to law school. Many, many applicants find it very difficult, especially, again, applicants who didn't have a uh, you know, topics such as networking or how to present yourself at the dinner table. What's your advice in terms of how to present those skills and think outside the box and say, hey, you know, I, I, I can transfer from this position from a law firm to, to uh, a university. These are the skills that are transferable. Yes, absolutely. I, I can think of transferable skills from just about every position, and it's simply a matter of packaging them correctly. Even if you worked at McDonald's before coming to law school and now you're applying for a summer job for your first summer and you're saying to yourself, but I don't have anything. I don't have any skills. Yes, you do. If you worked at McDonald's, you dealt with difficult people at times. You sold a product. I'm hoping you showed up on time at each day that you were supposed to be there. All of those are skills that you can talk about in your cover letter when trying to sell yourself to another employer. If you worked as a secretary, you're, you're used to working in an office environment. You've worked with other people and collaborated on projects. All of those are skills that you can talk about. There's, I can't think of a job that I can't sell you to an employer with. If you were a waiter or a waitress, again, you've worked with people, you've worked with difficult people, you have people skills. There's something in every job that you can use to sell yourself to an employer. And keep in mind, if we're talking about your 1L summer job after you finished your first year of law school, people are not expecting you to walk through the door able to stand in front of a judge and make uh, legal arguments. They're not expecting you to write a legal memo that's ready to submit to the Supreme Court. We all ex know that you're going to have a different level of experience than an actual practicing attorney. So don't make yourself stress out over, I don't have experience. There's something that we can sell from the experience that you do have. This is so extremely helpful. And I wanna tell all of those uh, uh, people who are listening to us, if you need to stop the video, rewind, please do so. This is extremely, extremely helpful. And what a great advice that could help many of us when we're putting our resume together. Right? Because that's very important. When, when we include our resume as part of our application, many applicants don't spend the time, the necessary time on their resume to uh, allow the resume to tell the story. Right. And this is the story behind the numbers, like I always say. Uh, even if you, as you mentioned, if you worked at McDonald's, you can still tell a story that could resonate with an admissions committee. So uh, thank you so much for, for that. And remember that and remember that you are not doing this by yourself. If you are in law school, the law school career services office has lots of people that want to help you put together the best documents possible to get a job. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Can you talk to us a little bit about, uh, first of all, we, we know that you are a first generation student and we're curious to, to learn a little bit about how has that shaped your perspective when it comes to, to your role and your position as, as an assistant dean? I think it gives me that empathy from having been in the very same shoes of some of the students that come through the door here. Um, I am first gen uh, college and first gen professional. Uh, my, my older brother started college, but was working, of course, because that's what some of us have to do. And he decided that the financial piece meant more to him than the education piece. So he left, he left college. So I am the first college graduate. I'm the first uh, professional school graduate, the first attorney um, in my, not just my immediate family, but my extended family as well. And so I think it gives me the perspective um, that I am walking, these students are walking the same path I walked um, many, many years ago. Um, where you hear conversations about things such as law review and you're not exactly sure what that means or why it should be important to you. And so I certainly have that perspective and try to present programming and initiatives that make sure that our students 
um, are aware of all of the opportunities that are available and the things that they should be taking advantage of while here in law school. That is so great and it's very comforting, uh, I'm sure, for the students at St. John's to have someone that they could feel comfortable uh, talking to and yeah. uh, understanding and knowing that they won't be judged, that being a first gen should not be something to be ashamed of. Absolutely. When, when I was in, in, in school, I, it wasn't called um, imposter syndrome, but I, I did feel uh, out of place. And like you mentioned, not knowing what law review means. I didn't even know what you know office hours meant when I was in college, right? Or what right. the birther's office right. uh, was all about. And navigating uh, as a first gen uh, was difficult. And, and we still see that that need. And to have people like you in that position who, who can really identify with the students is, is just um, really valuable and, and necessary. So can you talk to us a little bit about the initiatives that St. John's is involved with to address the issues of first-gen students, for example, and minority students? Sure. I think one of the things St. John's does better than most places that I've been is creating a community. There are so many opportunities for you to make connections with those like you, whether that's race, gender, identity, religion, whatever your connectivity is, there are so many opportunities for that. And we don't just say, hey, there are student groups, go join one. In the first week of classes, 1Ls are invited to a student of color barbecue. And all of the students of color in the first year class are invited. And then we invite the presidents and board members of our affinity groups, so LALSA, the Latin American Law Students Association, and BALSA, the Black American Law Students Association, all of the uh, LALSA, BALSA, SALSA, APALSA, all of those student orgs are present. We also invite the, the faculty of color, the administrators of color, the staff of color, so that we are all in one place, introduced at one time, so you never walk down the hall thinking, oh my goodness, I don't know anybody because you've had the opportunity to be introduced or to introduce yourself to um, all of the folks in the building who look like you or who have the same ideals as you, the same religious group as you. One of our deans does a welcome barbecue at his home for all of the members of Outlaws. So all of the LGBTQ students are there. Again, an opportunity to find your community before classes even start. And I feel like that's one of the most important things because a lot of times at these institutions, there are not a lot of people of color. And so the opportunity to make those connections early in your career. It's funny, um, one of the students said to me, he was sitting in the cafeteria by himself because he'd gone to a, a school that was mostly white. And he said, nobody wanted to sit with him. And so he was used to walking in and sitting by himself. And he sat at a table by himself. And then three BALSA students went and sat with him because they were like, hey, here's a new person. Let's go and chat with him. I feel like community is so important because there's nothing worse than feeling like you're in this stressful situation that is first year of law school by yourself with no one and no place to have the opportunity to be yourself. That is so strong here. I would also say that, of course, one of the big concerns for lots of students of color and first gen students are finances. You know, they'll tell you at the first day, you know, make sure you're not working as a first year law student. But if you are used to working and contributing to your finance, the finances of your family, your portion of the rent, your portion of the food, how can you tell someone they can't work? And so I think we do a great job of providing financial resources for students. We all know the financial calendar, right? That students who are not as financially well off may be struggling in August before loan money is dis dispersed. And they may be struggling again in April and May when loan money starts to run out. And this school does such a great job of providing resources. Um, if you come in here and tell me you're hungry, I have a voucher that I can give you for $20 where you can go downstairs in our cafeteria and get food. You don't even have to come and talk to me. There is a pantry 
up on the second floor that is funded by our faculty where you can walk in, you can get cup of noodles, you can get cereal and granola bars, toothpaste, deodorant, toilet paper, everything that you might need. And again, no shame, it's in a hidden corner. You walk in, there's a bag, you take what you need and you walk away. We have a career closet where if you're in need of um, professional clothing, you make an appointment through our career services office. You can go and pick, I think they allow you to take three suits and four blouses uh, for the ladies and for the men. Um, I think it's three suits and four shirts, as well as ties and belts. There are even shoes and bags, and again, at no cost. Um, if you come in and say, oh my goodness, I've got an interview and I forgot to dress professionally, or I, they just called me today, I have the interview and I don't have time to go home, and it's virtual. We'll suit you up and set you in front of a camera. And, and it's not, some of it is used clothes that have been cleaned, been to the dry cleaner, but one of our alum is uh, the general counsel at Macy's and she sent six racks of clothes, brand new on the rack, tags still attached for students to select their clothing from. The resources are made available to students to succeed. This is just so incredible. And I am so happy that our uh, members of our audience are listening to this. Please to all of you who are listening, who are considering law schools, uh, share this information with your friends. Uh, look at St. John's Law. And to me, this is so important to share this information because the sense of community is something that's extremely important when you're selecting a law school. It, it touches my heart. I, I personally was in, in, in that situation, not having the appropriate clothing, actually not even knowing how to dress for an interview, right? In my case, someone told me that I had to dress nice and I showed up in, you know, wearing a Sunday dress because for people who grew up in that kind of environment, dressing nice meant to wear something that you will wear to go to church. And I learned the lesson. I learned the lesson the hard way. Um, and back then, obviously, I didn't have the resources to purchase a, a suit. And, and to know that that your school does that, it, it's just going above and beyond. Is this something that, that comes from the community? Is this something that the alumni uh, is involved with? And, and I have heard that the alumni at St. John's is, is very loyal. So can, can you talk to us uh, a bit more about that? Sure. I have to say that I am incredibly impressed by the dedication of the St. John's Law alumni community. They, they're generous financially. They're generous with their time. They are generous with their experience. Um, I'd have to say uh, we have our alumni association has an alumni of color chapter, which is such a big part of what I do here at the law school, whether it's finding someone who works in a practice area who would be willing to speak to a student. And it's so helpful to find um, an alumni of color who then the student, I won't say they're immediately comfortable, but certainly much more comfortable speaking to someone who looks like them as opposed to the more challenging conversation with a, um, an attorney who is not an attorney of color. Um, and, and that's not to say that those alumni aren't equally generous and, and compassionate but it, it just makes it so much easier for our students. Um, the Alumni of Color chapter has a, what they call an alumni round table um, once a semester where they send seven or eight alums who come here and sit in, uh, we have a diversity center here on campus. It's a, a big suite where the students come and hang out and those alum come and sit here for two to three hours. Usually they do a panel discussion where they talk about things like networking and resumes and moot court and law review, all of the things that the students are just about to face um, to give them an idea of what it means and what they did while here at law school. Um, they talk about their practices and then they do more informal networking where they just sit around and eat pizza with the students who are present. The alumni are so generous with their time. My first, I'd been here for about two months and we did um, a panel discussion with alum and one of the 1Ls who had been in school for two weeks had just uh, told me that she wanted to be a public defender. And I said to her, well, hey, this, this alum over here 
works for the public defender's office here in Queens. Come with me, I'll introduce you. And we walked over and I introduced the two of them. The alum pulled out her cell phone, punched in her code and gave it to the student, said, put your number in here. I'm gonna call you on Monday and I want you to come and do a shadow day. She had met her one second before. And, and that I've seen that repeated all over the building all the time. <laughs> um, we have, I do a program we do an anti-racism day. I think we're one of the few schools in the country where we set aside an entire day where there are no classes and we do a full day of programming on racial justice issues. And I had an alum who uh, works for Amazon and that means she's based in Seattle. And I called her and asked if she would uh, participate in a panel discussion about IP and diversity in IP. And she said, so when is it? And I told her, and I was expecting her to appear virtually and she said, you know what? I'm going to be in New York for a conference that next week. Let me talk to um, the president. I'm going to fly in a couple of days earlier. And she did. Again, I'd never met her. So she had no, she didn't owe me anything. Just generous, as I said, with their time, talent, and attention. And you can't, you can't buy that. You can't buy that. So all of you who are thinking about law school, make sure you talk to the alumni office and find out about the commitment of the alumni. Make sure you talk to the Career Services Office and talk about the services that are available. All those things are so important to your, um, your career, to your path, to your e entire law school experience. Thank you for sharing that. It, and thank you for sharing those stories because they really highlight the importance of community and networking and finding a community that really is vested in your professional development and actually trying to discover whether, uh, you know, what type of law you might want to practice and to, to have the opportunity to have the, the alumni be so involved. Uh, it says a lot about them as individuals, but it says a lot about the law school itself. Uh, so uh, again, to, to those who are listening to us, as Dean Horn uh, mentioned, Make sure that you do your research. Make sure that you talk to current students. Make sure that you talk to the alum and how they speak about their law school and how they feel about their law school and how engaged they are uh, says a lot about the law school itself. If you could give a piece of advice to first-generation students, um, minority students who are currently considering law school, law school who are currently uh, preparing for law school, they're taking the LSAT, they are putting together their admissions package, uh, what what advice would you give them? I would say, look, so many of us are first generation, right? The only one in our, the only person in our family or our community to cross a threshold, whether that's as a first generation American, a first generation college student, a first generation professional. Um, and it's a beautiful thing to be the first and only, right? The one who has broken those generational patterns, right? We've become our ancestors' wildest dreams. I love that, that phrase. But it's tough, right? Because there's that delicate balance of not just surviving where you came from, but you also have to learn how to act like you belong where you're going. And I, I, I read a book um, and the woman who had written it was first gen. And she said, some say you're crossing a bridge, but you aren't crossing a bridge. You are the bridge. And sometimes that is a painful stretch um, from where you come from to where you hope to arrive. It's tough. But my first piece of advice to you would be to find someone you trust and ask questions. And as my mom used to tell me, the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. When you're in a group and others start talking about law review and moot court and other things that you have no clue what the heck they're talking about, Make mental notes to yourself about what they say and then ask your trusted person for advice. Then take what you've learned and continue to ask for advice because a lot of times your trusted person is going to be another student and I want you to be sure that you're getting the correct information. My advice to you is never believe that it will be easy, but always believe that it can be done. 
I really like your metaphor, redefining the path of a first gen as as the bridge, right? In, in that resonates. Any other uh, thoughts that you might have as to the application process is, itself? Thinking about the LSAT is not something that is um, very pleasant for many of us. Many of them uh, are also working, are also studying, and overall can be overwhelming. Any advice that you might have for those who are listening and who are currently also putting together their application or thinking about applying to law school? It's expensive too. And that I think that's one of the biggest challenges for those of us that are first gen and, and diverse. Take advantage of all of the free opportunities out there. Um, make sure you check out LSAC, LSAC, the Law School Admissions Council. Their website has a lot of links to free LSAT preps. Check your law schools that you're interested in to see if they provide links or information regarding resources for preparing for LSATs and law school in general. There are free things out there, but they're sometimes hard to dig up. I would say make sure you ask for help. If you're still in college, go to your guidance counselor or, or whatever they call them at the college level. There has to be someone who helps with writing statements. Again, ask the law schools that you're thinking about applying for if they provide those types of services. Don't assume that you have to do everything on your own. There, there may be opportunities for assistance. Thank you for that. Uh, so I have one last question for you, Dean Horn, and um, I, I want to ask you, is there anything that you will want to share with the audience that we didn't discuss? And I want to thank, actually, you, I want to thank St. John's uh, for being a sponsor to our conference. We're having a conference in June where we are going to provide resources and our members of our audience and, and law students and current law students will have access to law school professionals, panelists, and we want to thank uh, St. John's for being one of the sponsors at, at our conference. But I also want to give you the opportunity before we go to just share anything else that you think that students should know that you wish they knew before they arrived in law school. I wish I knew that it's not shameful to make a mistake. If you are human, you are going to make a mistake. And I want you to go in not excited or happy that you'll make a mistake, but aware that it will happen. It doesn't mean you um, don't belong. It doesn't mean you're not worthy. It simply means that you made a mistake. And I want you to keep in mind that it might be helpful to you to share with someone coming behind you the reality of that mistake that you made in the hopes that you can keep them from making that same mistake. I would say, listen to those who have gone before you, whether it's um, a current law student or an attorney, and whatever they are willing to share about their missteps or their advice, take it to heart because I feel that when we share the reality of, of our experiences, when we reveal that reality, it makes you a little bit more free, right? Now you're not hiding it. And it also makes you a little bit less alone because I guarantee you, the person that you're talking to is gonna say, oh, well, you think that's bad. There was a time when I did fill in the blank. So prepare to make missteps and don't be ashamed of them. Thank you so much for, for reminding many of us that, that it's okay to make mistakes. Sometimes we carry this burden uh, as a minority student, as a first gen, and we feel that we, we are representing uh, a group. And I think many of us uh, carry that and we need someone to remind us. So thank you. And I hope that the audience enjoy uh, this conversation as much as I did. And I want to thank you so, so much for being here today. And we appreciate what you in St. John's uh, is doing for all of our students. Thank you so much. For those of you who are watching, if you like this video, please make sure that you share it. Please make sure that you like it. And we, we will see you next time. Thank you so much for being here.